Hello, everybody, and welcome to That Dog Training Show with Tanya Yarbrough. And this is the show we talk about the dogs we love and the stupid human behaviors we don't, also known as shubs. Although today, this show will be a little more positive. It is uh, all about animal careers, the not-so-obvious ones anyway. So um, I was actually inspired by the numerous stories you see on the Internet, particularly Facebook, about all kinds of dogs being helped out by prosthetics. We've seen the, you know, the wheeled cart for front leg or hind leg mobility, um, a dog who will get a new nose, which is pretty impressive, eyes, hearing aids, canine pacemakers, you name it in the human world, it's available in the dog world or is about to be available in the dog world. Uh, excepting for nudicles, those prosthetic testicles. I don't know of any guys who actually need to fill an empty nut sack, but there it is. I'm going to pretty much say that it doesn't exist. And if it does, it's all in the hush-hush. Anyway, um, my career as a dog trainer actually started with a natural childhood interest in animals that uh, I basically fostered, and I would say my, my mother fostered, with multiple trips to the library. Um, that's a place where they keep lots of books that you can read and possibly even borrow, for those of you in Rio Linda. And by being a very observant child, basically, I was uh, pretty good at like paying attention to human and animal behavior and mimicking body language. So... With that, it was fortified by a bachelor's degree in biology uh, with the intent of becoming a veterinarian, but I still had this really deep interest in animal behavior, so I kept that afloat with my hobbies and with animal behavior classes, etc. So when people ask me how to become a dog trainer, I don't really have a very satisfying answer to anyone because it's just like acting. There are so many roads to the same goal, and I pretty much, I think, was blindsided by the opportunity to become a dog trainer. It just, it was, the obvious was not obvious to me, but that was how it came about. Some people go to classes and actually have that intent to be, uh, for that career, but um, that wasn't the case for me. And I find a lot of really good dog trainers out there, um, they also had some really odd roads into uh, becoming dog trainers. There are the obvious animal careers like groomers, vet techs, and veterinarians, or trainers and behavioralists, and these are may or may not have obvious career paths like I just explained, but I come from a science background, so in light of all these uh, new prosthetics and um, medical, um, you know, engineering that's going on, I... It just it fascinates me the gamut of fields that are required for just addressing the problems of replacing, say for instance, a missing limb on a dog. There's the physiokinetic engineering and calculations, the knowledge of biophysics and of the undulation of a normal walk for each body type of various dog breeds, the mechanical engineering that designs the prosthetics that perfectly matches the specifics of a dog's amputation, what's left of that amputation, the size of the dog, the weight, the ratio of body height to length, and the calculation of the best, usually man-made materials, and using and building these, these objects. With the mechanical engineering, there's also the graphic design. Not to be poo-pooed because it's necessary to help to make, make the prosthetic pleasing in appearance to the dog owner. You might have a very useful prosthetic for their dog, but if it looks like it's made of scraps from a junkyard, the owner is not likely to have much faith in the product. So there has to be some way of uh, manufacturing it to make it look good. Then there are the marketers who let the world know that the prosthetic exists and all that is entailed in obtaining one for their dog most especially making the product easily found and obtained. Then there are the veterinarians who have to be open to leaving as much of an amputated limb as possible so that the prosthetic could be used rather than amputating right at the joint, which is what we mostly see when we see pictures of dogs who have just like three legs or sometimes two legs. They're, dead, they're taken off at the joint, which may not be absolutely necessary, but it just because for so many decades there wasn't the opportunity of a prosthetic, it's just common practice to remove the entire limb as opposed to just that which is diseased or damaged. Um... So then you have the uh, physical therapists and trainers involved in helping the dog to get used to the prosthetic, to even like the prosthetic, and then help develop all the supporting muscles necessary besides the lost muscle and bone to allow the dog to have a somewhat normal level of activity without added pain, without added stress, um, and that sort of thing. 
there are the massage therapists that are necessary to help dogs overcome some of the opposing muscle group cramping when they learn to use a prosthetic or if they find this is happening a lot to simply determine that their particular prosthetic may not be suitably fitted for the dog so they have to go back to square one and recalculate things. So uh, when I want to talk about opposing muscle group, um, if there's an injury, say for instance in the right front leg and they have to put on a prosthetic, then that means the back on the left side as well as on the rear uh, left leg is going to be overcompensating for any unusual movements or non-movements in the undulation, the normal ambulatory pattern of that dog. So when it's uh, all this compensating going on, there can be a lot of cramping and even possibly some stress on the spine that could lead to more injury. So massage therapists are very important for this. Occupational therapists as well. So I'll, well, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on other things. But yeah, there are companies too that manufacture replacement parts for prosthetics for dogs, for things that break down or wear down like the pads that are under prosthetic limb. There are the medical supplies in helping to maintain a healthy stub for that particular amputated limb. You have to take care of the hair and the skin and everything else to make sure that nothing is com is more damaged from the use of that prosthetic. Um, and that requires some extra medical supplies. Um, there are more and more advances on prosthetic limbs and robotics controlled by the brain. Now, it's a growing field in the human world, but I guarantee you it's starting to happen in the dog world. So biomedical engineers are on the uprise in terms of just working with animals on having prosthetics. It is actually, there's more money involved, I think, at that at this point in uh, using prosthetics and robotics and things like uh, the dolphin without a tail, etc. So uh, you see it with a lot of zoos and when we're doing conservation work for animals, um, you see a lot more biomedical engineering involved. Now each dog and each need is slightly different. So where are you engineers? Where are you, you biophysical kinesiologists? Where are you, biochemists, you physicists, you medical engineers, you graphic designers, massage therapists and trainers for medical patients who are animals? Maybe that's you. Now that's just the prosthetics. There are also the ortho orthotics, the braces for hind legs and front legs and neck and back for ACL injuries and soft tissue injuries and spinal injuries. What about the their, what about the nerve damaged limbs or backs and the physical therapists who specialize in animals with water therapy and toys and textural occupational therapy to help dogs regain some of their neuromuscular function? Then there are the people who devote their time and efforts in establishing nonprofits to help people pay for the prosthetics, the surgeries, the orthotics, and other medical care necessary to save the lives of the animals, but also the life quality of those animals. That requires PR experts, marketing experts, social media efforts. There are the blogs who de disseminate information. This podcast, for instance, just right now, I'm giving you information. Hopefully all Goodwell's researched information. <laughs> the journalists, photographers, and keen observers who have all kinds of ways of communicating things about the animal world. All of those need to have jobs and jobs filled in the future. Those are all animal careers. How about the dog acupuncturists and holistic treatments? Then there are the nutritional biologists developing better mass-produced foods and finding dietary cures and preventative measures for a whole slew of dog health issues. There are the dog, the food, dog food testers. Yes, people who taste the food and the dogs who are the test subjects, from the food wolfers to the finicky eaters. I mean, imagine being one of those dog owners whose side job is to actually go to food manufacturer and have their dog eat their newest food product and then take down notes. Or maybe you don't even have to take down the notes. Somebody else does, and you go home with it and give them any, like, you know, side effects, etc. So... Not to mention, with all of those things, the graphic artists and marketers for those products, the manufacturers of leashes and collars that people need, um, who are knowledgeable, they need people who are knowledgeable and experienced with dogs to come up with new products, along with the mechanical engineers who know of the newest polymers to help design the latest products. Home groom product, grooming products. Remember the onset of the petty paws product craze? I have one of those suckers. It takes a dog lover to understand the benefit of the product and to come up with the idea. 
And then there are the people who realize a need and open the door to dog training and jobs for dogs requiring their natural gifts like odor detection for um, bed bugs, food allergens, seizures, cancer, diabetes, panic attacks, heart attacks, narc- uh, narcotics, explosives, arson and propellant dis- detection, search and rescue. With sniff work and training, there is a need for chemists who can determine the exact titration or concentration of each, each kind of practice scent sample. There's kennel designs, automotive products, active wear, and toy designers, all these things to make our lives with dogs more adventurous, full, and healthy. They require things like business degrees, engineering degrees, artistry of different types, including sculpting, drawing, painting, biochemical engineering, kinesiology knowledge, And wait, there's more. Hotel businesses, restaurant designers for dog-friendly patios, house and interior designers, lawyers and litigation specialists, insurance underwriters, animal control agents, resort owners, transportation specialists, city planners and managers, textile manufacturers, materials manufacturers, data specialists and analysts, forestry services, wildlife and game wardens, animal shelter administrators, habitat specialists for zoos and conservatories. But all of it requires guts to come up with an idea and some knowledge and some education or to help someone with that idea that already has that knowledge or education and put it out there for people to find, experiment, improve, and draw the best out of ourselves. So if you or your child or your nephew or whatever say they want to work with animals, open their eyes to all the possibilities, the possible angles and degrees and experiences that can lead to a career in working strictly with animals. It's more than just the obvious. I think one of the things that really fascinated me when I was living in Lexington, Kentucky, was the development of the um, equine uh, water rehabilitation center. We had all these horse races. This is an area of a lot of horse races and breeding. And these are animals that they spend millions of dollars of breeding and raising and training. And one small injury that maybe another animal could handle, they lose all of the investment they put in this animal. And oftentimes, I should say, almost all the time, they would put the animal down. So in an effort to save the animal, even if it was to be just to be used for breeding or to give it a a good home after it could no longer race, they developed a whole center, an equine center for rehabilitation that was its main focus was having this gigantic pool that was designed for horses who were lame and had injuries to relearn to walk and develop their neurology, develop their musculature, to heal all of the cartilage and soft tissue that was damaged and inflamed and and give them a weightless experience so that this 2,000-pound animal could actually rehabilitate without risking more injuries, breaking an ankle or whatever. It also increase their self-esteem. Uh, horses like to move, by the way. So do dogs. And when animals don't you know, just like people, if they don't have the opportunity to move around and be somewhat active and somewhat mentally stimulated, their self-esteem, their spirit kind of, <laughs> kind of dies. And so they were finding that even if they couldn't rehabilitate these animals to be racers again, giving them the opportunity to have another role in life was quite rewarding for the animal and the people. So When it comes to working with animals, open your eyes to all the opportunities and all the kinds of education that can go into just dealing with animal careers. It's not just, you know, veterinarians and vet techs and groomers and dog trainers, which, you know, if you can find a direct path to being a dog trainer, good luck to you. There's a a lot of, like, crazy dog training uh, schools that don't really lend to a very happy career. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, think of this too. It's not just about working with animals. This is something else that I had to learn the hard way as a young person. That um, I thought working with animals meant not having to deal with people because I wasn't very good.